Welcome one, welcome all to the final quarterly edition of the Album Awards. Arriving in laid-back, unprofessional style is your host, John from ARTV. I thought we agreed to not rip the band-aid off right away. Well, I do make the rules. Well, at least I'm honest. Hey neighbors, welcome to the Quarter 3 2021 Album Awards. Quarter 3 ran from July 1st through September 30th, meaning everything I'm covering in this ceremony has to have dropped during that time frame. I know, I know, you're wondering if I'm gonna address the opening remarks, and no, no details, no further comment? There will be no questions at this time. I'm kidding! Come on, get, get back over here. Listen, we've been making this beautiful show for almost two years now. And while I love the concept of death and I feel so proud of what we made out of it, things just aren't working out in a way that makes this viable for me to do every single quarter. But all is not lost forever because I found a way to make this make sense and you'll get a taste of the future right here in the Q3 Roundup. The Album Awards will now be a bi-annual ceremony to take place in July and late December of each year. July's will be a mid-year reflection that will include tier rankings of each album I've reviewed, and the end of the year edition will factor in everything from the entire year in that list, but this won't start until July of next year. Let's go out on a high note though, I've got a wide range of albums to cover as we remember the good times and know that it's not goodbye forever, just a recalibration as I continue to try and give you guys the best content possible. Please support the final quarterly roundup by getting this video to a thousand likes, subscribe Subscribe if you happen to be new, and roll out the red carpet, cause I've got about 20 albums to cover. Inhaler get the Silver Lining Award for It Won't Always Be Like This. You've inevitably heard the buzz around Inhaler if you're into alt-rock, especially if you're living UK adjacent, and I think they've done a pretty solid job at making it based on their own merits, despite their lead singer literally being the son of U2's Bono. Ice Cream Sunday made the rounds in 2019, and it sounds fine enough, but for a song about chocolate syrup, it wasn't all that sticky, and didn't end up making the cut for the album. Nonetheless, I decided to give their debut It Won't Always Be Like This a shot, and I hear loads of potential in these young lads. But here's the hard part. It's way too polished and by the numbers to be great. One thing Inhaler does really well is creating emotional stakes. Even most of the songs that I don't find memorable at least express themselves decently, but it's the damnedest thing. You can't quite pin down why so many of them just feel like passers-by. Almost like you know something cool is happening, but you can't be bothered to look up since you're pretty sure that you're not really missing out. Don't take that as me dismissing this record entirely. Far from it. I really like some of the grooves they get into. My honest face boils over with sizzling bass and loads of vocal bravado. Plus you'll get some mileage out of the smoky 1975 sounding totally, and My King Will Be Kind leaves a sour but nostalgic taste as the instrumentation specifically goes so hard. It won't always be like this gets a spot in the C tier. I almost went with B, but I just don't feel that my heart is quite there. That would be me giving into the hype behind them. I do think if we give it a few years, I think Inhaler are going to make a very special album. This is just their debut, and if they can shake off the influences that are weighing them down, they're gonna get there. The Venomous Kiss Award goes to Sleigh Bells for Texas. The indie hype cycle can be a vicious one. Build them up, show them love for a few albums, then forget them like they're some old toy even if the old toy never lost that shiny new feel. I think that's exactly what happened to noise pop duo Sleigh Bells because God knows they never fell off and the electrifying Texas is living proof. I liked Locust Laced as a single when it came out, but I was also kinda guilty of forgetting about them and the sea of new releases that we've had in 2021. But when I returned to hear the full album, that song felt perfectly at home, hitting like a ton of bricks alongside the likes of the jittery in Acre Lost, and the jaw-dropping beat shifter Justine Go Genesis. You won't believe how well the formula of heavy guitars meets bubbly, smashing synths with a pretty voice singing about some pretty vicious things still works. Not a single song loses me. I mean, a couple in the back half don't quite swing the fly swatter as hard for the kill, but it's not like a major bummer or anything. I can easily put this on top in the S tier. They just keep making it work, and I couldn't be happier to crank the volume knob to 11 as they let the river run wild. The Vanguard Award goes to Foxing for Draw Down the Moon. Wringing your mind dry of the searing nearer my god is damn near impossible. 
It's that unshakable destination that guides your darkest of nights all the way from the Albatross to Dealer, and now again on the perhaps brighter but still grieving Draw Down the Moon. Foxing are insanely overlooked outside of the Indie Chamber. Like, if you mention the band name to someone, they're either gonna think, did you mean boxing? Or maybe that you're really into book restoration like Cho from you. Or maybe they'll just pretend to know, while internal confusion makes them think that you're really into fox hunting. Nope, the only thing this band is hunting for are your emotions. Bag it and tag it, they're gonna win that game every time. Draw Down the Moon dances on the edge of a breakthrough while retaining plenty of the eccentric emo-tanged lullabies they boldly sealed in the past. I was late to the party with Nearer My God being my baptism by fire, but consider me born again with the also great but not quite on that level LP4. The momentum does feel a bit stunted lyrically, not a huge roadblock, but it's nowhere near as complex, but sometimes the simplicity of missing home or even airing out your demons to wonder aloud why you no longer feel strong emotional reactions to things is more than enough to give your song the wings it needs. It's the core musical integrity of the band unit that makes this album purely intoxicating. Passing the baton from whirlwinds of guitar to magnetized synths or pounding drums remind us of the life within the walls. So even if the rather repetitive hooks of cold-blooded or go down together fail to catch you at first, focus in on the creative structures and maybe it'll hit different. The Idol Worship Award goes to Pressure Machine by The Killers. First of all, stream the abridged version, people. Maybe one listen to the small town interviews and you get the point. Past that, you're basically watching tumbleweeds blow down the street in Brandon Flowers' hometown. Only 51 weeks passed after the stunning comeback imploding the Mirage, but there they are, Dave Kunig in hand, Pressure Machine. Pressure Machine strips back the sound and tells the tale of other people inspired by real life events. There's an admirable attempt at flushing it all out. I love some of the more sparse moments of intimacy as some of the more inevitable flashes of grandeur that has the killers written all over it, but I just can't help but feel like they struggle to keep the plane flying at a consistent altitude, so the B tier feels fitting for this. Don't You Feel Amazing by Trash Boat Get the Cocktail Shaker Award. I don't have a ton to say about Trash Boat's new shapeshifter, but I can also promise that this isn't bad news. It's actually more on the good side. Give it up for the growth these lads have put on display. They've completely grown taller than what the canopy of pop punk told them they can be, and they did it way faster than anyone would have ever expected. Don't You Feel Amazing isn't at all in that realm. Actually, it's more of a grungy, heavy, poppy, alt-rock crunch punch than anything else. And even when it's kind of going off the rails, it's hard to hate. Toby Duncan is really standing out as an invigorating band leader, both in terms of image, stage control, and writing. Trash Boat haven't had a single lineup change since their inception in 2014, which is surprising to me, but it also speaks volumes about their willingness to experiment and how they can be on the same page. I'd say the ultra-strong first half of Amazing captures a decent spread of talent on camera, from the powerful title track to the haunting He's So Good, and even the zany focus Bad Entertainment puts on a pedestal. But you probably knew what was coming when I said first half specifically, because this album is definitely front-loaded. Not quite like the Titanic on the iceberg or anything that magnitude. Thankfully, we've got some great moments like Synthetic Sympathy or even The Closer, but overall, it's hard to get a streak going in the back half. Let's put the British band's second full-length album in the B tier. I appreciate the growth, the heart, and the flexibility that Don't You Feel Amazing shows off, as it auctions off a healthy dose of sarcasm that blends into a reality that can feel very hopeless. Certified Lover Boy by Drake gets the Judge a Book by Its Cover Award. Remind me, why the fuck do so many people still care about Drake? The man has self-admittedly been checked out for years on sleeping pills, with nothing provocative to say. I don't think he's made a solid, not bloated to the nines album since nothing was the same in 2013. When you hit a certain level of fame in the rap game, your lack of hunger lights up like bodily fluids under a black light in a shit hotel. So consider the long-delayed certified lover boy another apathetic jizz stain to absorb in Drake's musical mattress of a career. Throwing this one down in the F tier, I seriously don't care, don't see why you should either. You might find a few high points beat-wise or in some of the flows, but it's really just not worth it at all. The Sophomore Samesies Award goes to This Is How The World Ends by Bad Flower. 
Y'all are gonna break down the door if I don't hurry the fuck up with these next two. So let's start with the hard rock band Bad Flower and their sophomore record, This Is How The World Ends. You might remember I enjoyed the hell out of OK I'm Sick, but to cough up the truth here, <coughs> That album didn't actually have the shelf life I thought it would. It faded from my mind pretty quick outside of a few choice cuts, but I was ready to give album two a fair shake to see if they could reel me back in. The boys have pieced together a solid experience this time, so let go of that breath you're holding in. I didn't do a total 180 on Bad Flower. I just think that their frontman's off-the-rails characterizations either really hit the mark or else fall into a pile of cringe, and there doesn't seem to be much of an in-between. Warming up takes a hot minute. I really don't think they find the path until family, which which definitely resonated with me. I love the somber tone and the honest anger towards people you're supposed to feel something for. Stalker is chaotic and lands close to the top of the best on the record as they bottle the toxicity of online cult-like behavior in a song, bolstered by some furious riffs and a manic vocal showing by Josh Katz. Machine Gun was surprisingly emotional for something I was kinda iffy on at first, and I actually noticed that they kind of seem to clickbait their titles with something that can feel edgy, but has some social commentary packed in. And I think that's where the teeter-totter that they ride on can happen, based on whether or not they stick the landing. I'm gonna put this in the B tier. I like it overall for sure, but I definitely get agitated at the lack of finesse on some of the moments where they just straight up sound like the used or a radio rock band. She Knows cuts off out of nowhere, and I really don't care if that's intentional. I hate it. Fuckboy kind of sucks, but if you can get past some of the light monotony, I think you'll dig this one overall. The, well, uh, that was a thing award goes to Casey Musgraves for Starcrossed. I am at a loss with this one. I just don't understand how we go from album of the year worthy golden hour to Starcrossed. And let me start by saying, I don't dislike this album because Casey left country in the rear view. It's not the genre that's the problem. It's the bizarre, out-of-touch feeling of disconnect we're left with that makes this project such a damn chore to get through. If you're out of the loop, Casey Musgraves was riding the high of newlywed life last time around the sun, but this album rides out big D energy. And by D, I mean divorce. No one wants to go through that, but I was low-key interested and intrigued to see what kind of art would come from that major life change. After listening to this album time and time again, trying desperately to find the missing link that would make it all click, I'm just gonna say it. Starcrossed is a fucking snooze fest. Boring adult contemporary radio fodder overflows faster than a fire truck hose filling a kiddie pool as the benign instrumental arrangements pry at your patience, while Casey finds a lot of different ways to say, I got divorced, without actually saying much of anything that would actually make these stories feel unique to her. Only in the tender moments of camera roll and if this was a movie do we get the level of emotive art her past works brought in in droves. Each of those feels jaded but warm, with camera roll striking me as easily the best thing about Starcrossed. It's a phenomenal moment of clarity that uses sparse atmospheres to its advantage. Much of the runtime is dedicated to passing off simple-minded tinkering like it's some sort of introspective revelation, and it just feels so empty and try-hard. Breadwinner could have been written by anyone, and the hook sounds like a D-tier popified version of something Casey herself would have written for pageant material. Justified sinks like a stone with a droll, predictable lull. What Doesn't Kill Me rubs shoulders with lazy hip-hop beats and age-old cliches. And don't even get me started on the terribly out-of-place finale that's sung entirely in Spanish, and it flat-out doesn't work. You can fill in the blanks on much of the remaining content, but I don't hate the album. I hate the massive drop in quality that feels void of really any resonating feelings. You can make all the moves, you can aim all the spotlights, but something about Starcross just really doesn't sit right. I'm putting this one in the C tier, and trust me, that's borderline. Interrobang nabs Switchfoot the Comeback of the Year Award. Yeah, after the last decade of activity, I really didn't see myself loving a Switchfoot album again, but it happened. They did it, and the reason why is something so simple. It's almost like they listened to the feedback on the past few albums and took it to heart. This is a tried and true respectable band, but they've been flirting heavily with the bad side of mainstream pop since Fading West. And while that and Where the Light Shines Through had some incredible jolts of joy, 
and Native Tongue kinda totally botched it. Which is why Interrobang is a beautiful reset instead of a letdown. I Need You To Be Wrong comes out as the first single, and color me intrigued. It's weird, stringy, and a definite curveball, but it works on a human level. But that wasn't what sold me the news. That award goes to Fluorescent, with its wing flapping evolving into a full-on soar with those incredible harmonies, a chorus that gets better every time it hits, and a really insightful outlook lyrically from the ever-intelligent John Foreman. Interrobang is as expressive as its title implies, with some very smart musicians doing their thing. It's an album that finally gives up the ghost of relativity in exchange for a mature, refined effort that actually feels like a later year's renaissance that makes sense for who they are and who they've always been. This one's going A tier! I thoroughly enjoyed how emotive and well-packaged Interrobang was. Fluorescent hooked me, but I kept coming back for the bass-fueled mental warfare of Splinter, the vibrant advice guru if I were you, Wolves with its ominous symphonic atmosphere, and definitely Lost Cause 2, and not just because of that great pun. The Blackout Eclipse Award goes to Solar Power by Lord. Plain Jane's sunny day sing-alongs with flat acoustics, thoughtless writing, and insipid production makes Lord's third album feel like chugging an unfiltered glass of tap water in a cult. It's a postcard saying, everything's great here, miss you, XOXO, except you're worried this is a cry for help underneath the happy message. Solar Power might be the most disappointing album I've ever listened to. The muted music feels disheartening, like it's lacking a purpose to exist beyond the fact that a new album was due, so here's LP3! The New Zealand Queen's first two were albums I gave perfect scores to. But holy moly, was this a D-tier strikeout that will have you cringing, nervously laughing as you try to go along with the guise of satire, but more than anything, you'll probably shed a tear remembering the magic that you used to feel with Lord. The Flowmaster Award goes to The Melodic Blue by Baby Keen. Any hip-hop heads watching right now have probably heard the buzz around Baby Keem and his first full album, The Melodic Blue, and I get why the hype is off the charts. He has genuinely unique flows, biting hooks, and of course, a major connection in the industry, the man's uncle is Kendrick fucking Lamar. The Melodic Blue's best songs have K-Dot on them, Family Ties, and Range Brothers. Fantastic rhymes, great chemistry, trading bars, you can feel the heat. They're in the moment having fun and taking shots, but that's where the issue comes in. They're so damn good, I just don't see any of the album's other cuts coming in that high. There are still some great songs as South Africa keeps the rhythm flowing with a bit of old school hip hop bounce, Don Tolliver helps set off the earworm Coco as both rappers conjure up enough charm to make it a hit, and to rewind back to the starting line, I really love Trademark USA. It's the best solo performance from Baby Keem, it's dark, calculated, but versatile as fuck. That sets up the barrier though. The best track that doesn't have a feature is track one, and it also has the best beat switch outside of the Kendrick collabs. So many rappers are trying to have their producers constantly set up these beat switches, it feels like it's way too often for it to actually be a jaw-dropping moment. It's like getting all of your Christmas presents early. The melodic blue goes down in the B tier. I am down with the style, Baby Keem's got an attitude that deserves to break out much like his uncle Kendrick did in the early 2010s, but let's see if this promising debut turns into a full album that can stand on its own even without the family ties. The Golden Arrow Award goes to Happier Than Ever by Billie Eilish. You can't mention Billy without Phineas, and together this golden duo wove a seamless record that glares with the maturity of a great coming-of-age film, complemented further by the production techniques of a musical madman that essentially salts the rim of every margarita she poured. Happier Than Ever is 16 songs, 56 minutes, yet it never feels that long, nor does it ever get stale. There's variety galore from the angelic gold wing to the booming telepathy overheated serves, but that's just the tip of the melting iceberg. Billy's critics were waiting for a sophomore slump, but they got a grand slam instead, and I think this is her best work to date. The Invisible Ink Award goes to XOXO by The Main. Rock Steady. The main were rock steady for 15 years, but their new one XOXO was the glass ball falling from the ceiling and shattering in real time. 
I just didn't expect them to go this route. The whole shallow pop, regurgitated hooks, don't even sound like yourself path that so many bands seem to take as they get older. The main didn't bake a bad record seven times in a row. From the MySpace days that might look a little bit silly in retrospect to the mature but still fun you are okay. But XOXO isn't good. And you could make the pointless argument, well, I bet you'd like it if you didn't know it was them. But first of all, no. Secondly, that planet doesn't exist. They made it. There's a few slappers in there. Shout out to April 7th and the emotional face towards the sun. But for a band that kept us fawning over their anthemic hooks and soaring alternative melodies, they disappointed here by borrowing a lot from their past music. It's like they gutted the old ones, overprocessed, filtered in more cliches, and made them again, except the lyrics aren't very good. Actually, High Forever straight up sucks, and I can't believe that the main sold out to the beat of an Imagine Dragons drum. Pop isn't the dirty word, it's the fact that they did us dirty by stapling together a mostly soulless outing, and it ain't pretty or beautiful. Sorry boys, I do love ya, but this one was a epic letdown. It's right down there in the D tier, in fact, and I feel like I'm already forgetting that the album even exists. The Future of Punk Award goes to Glow On by Turnstile. Rambunctious, aggressive, in-your-face riffage with a soul as pure as the first animated children's film you ever fell in love with. Welcome to the world of Turnstile, the single most exciting band in the hardcore punk scene right now. Glow On was produced by Mike Elizondo and Brendan Yates as they took the reins from the incredible Will Yip, who worked with Turnstile on Space and Time in 2018. They left a pretty long gap between records, but the hype was louder than ever following the trilogy of singles that spearheaded the campaign for new music over the summer. I can't believe I wasn't into them sooner, but after Holiday sucker punched the fuck out of my cerebral cortex, I knew I was going all in, put it on turnstile and walk away a winner. Holiday remains my favorite track overall, but there's some insane competition that proves just how versatile punk can be. It's dreamy, it's cranked up to 11, it's all over the place, but somehow in a way that makes perfect sense. This is music to light your mind on fire to. The riff storms of Wild World, Blackout, and Endless provide the head-slamming adrenaline rush, and the uniquely flavored cuts like Underwater Boy and the Twisted Wonder Fly Again make me feel happy to just exist at the same time that their music is existing. Obviously, we're going S-tier on this genre-bending slice of life. There's the occasional pacing issue, but it's so, so minor. You're watching master chefs in their prime, cooking up dishes unlike anything you've ever tasted, at least not for a very long time, and definitely not to this degree. Churches scare up the Heart Stabber Award for screen violence. The synth pop trio Churches returned from isolation with a self produced album, Screen Violence, that touches their roots by utilizing massive synths and ear candy hooks. But they also do evolve forward with the sizzling addition of guitars that pop up on several of the most momentous tracks as they make this haunted 80s leaning screen come to life. As a unit, their chemistry is off the charts. Lauren Mayberry's voice is only getting stronger. The guys are contributing big time with these expansive arrangements that are using more traditional instruments than ever before. It's just a massive fucking win all the way around. And for a record stuffed full of S tier cuts, you know exactly where this is landing. Sleep Token get the Masked Intruder Award for This Place Will Become Your Tomb. Mysterious figures cloaked in robes, makeup, and alter egos are automatic draws because of our natural human curiosity. Who are they? What is Vessel? What are they worshipping? None of these questions and more will be answered on Sleep Token's sophomore album This Place Will Become Your Tomb, which is exactly how they wanted to play the hand. If the mystery is gone, perhaps a little bit of that magic dies with it. So shuffle the deck, let them deal. Sundowning released in late 2019, and unfortunately, I didn't hear it until after I had put out my year and list videos, but it did get a spot on my best albums of the decade. So I think that should show you how much I fell in love with that album. It's harrowing as hell, so naturally, I was foaming at the mouth to hear the next chapter. You see me right now, no mask, no rope, also no foam at the mouth, I don't think. Hey, why isn't this tomb enfolding me? 
Is it the pop-soaked melodies, the overabundance of concept, the longer wait times between payoffs? Maybe it's all of those things, but also none of them at the same time? Sleep Token haven't done much to build on the groundswell they rightfully earned with LP1. But I do have to put it out there that they do have some great tracks here. I think that the gorgeous nightmare of Alkaline and also the more quietly delivered pulsations of the love you want should be enough to kind of quell your fear of change being the problem. I guess it's more just like trying to get to the heart of an armor knight. I know it's in there, underneath somewhere, but I'm having a hell of a time trying to break through. I found much of the production to be distracting, almost like it's trying to compensate for the lack of death hiding on something like Descending or Fall For Me with its gimmicky Imogen Heat vocoder effect. Stir in a few sleepy ballads to boot and baby, you got a nap going. I love this album most when they find a reason for it to exist, a la the piano-heavy Telomeris that ends in a fiery roar, and the heavy-hitting Hypnosis that blew me away by the time the final anchor dropped. Cherry-pick a handful of songs for your playlist basket and call it a day. I don't think the album has strong legs as a full 52-minute body of work. Sleep Token get caught up trying to frame artistry while also reaching for the stars, and results may vary to the point where I have to put this in the C tier. I wish I loved it, but I walked away blue balled and only loving certain tracks. But wait, there's more. It's time for the Patreon roundup. We have three reviews to do. Thank you so much to the patrons that made them possible. The 1982 album Avalon by Roxy Music, as requested by Decalis. This is sublime in the coolest, most refined way I could ever say. Roxy Music were an English art pop and rock band who released their final album Avalon, the one I'm reviewing now, all the way back in 1982. Avalon is widely seen as one of, if not the best record they released, selling more copies worldwide than any of their previous efforts. And now that I've gone back and sampled even more of the songs from their discography outside of this, I'm surprised that this was their final adventure, yet somehow it also makes perfect sense with how beautiful it all feels. Mesmerizing bliss crosses your mind like the calming breeze of a summer day or the babbling brook in the background of a perfect fall evening. Roxy Music made a retreat of serenity in a sea of floating clouds. The album just puts you in the best of moods, I swear. Can we also just appreciate that an album from the early 80s still sounds this fucking pristine? This is mint with the light touches of brass and saxophone, smoothed out guitar work, and even the danceable vocals that light the torch for a classic experience. Dipping all the way into the album made me really appreciate their knack for timing, rhythm, groove, and transitioning. To Turn You On has some gorgeous melodies. I adore the dark bumping bass the space between brings in dark waves along with the sexy saxophone. And India really works nicely as an interlude as it gives way to While My Heart Is Still Beating. Roxy Music are going all the way to S tier with Avalon. No way, no why, just straight up putting things at the level that they've earned. The 10th anniversary of The Unforgiving by Within Temptation as requested by Brandon Barenfeld. Symphonic metal isn't something I really listen to a ton of, but I've listened to some songs by Within Temptation, and I respected Sharon's voice from a distance. But now that I've got a request to cover their popular album, The Unforgiving, as a late way of celebrating its 10th anniversary, I got my first full album experience listening to Within Temptation. I can now officially report back, eh, it's okay. Not bad, but not great. The biggest problem I have with this record is its constant flux between mainstream radio rock appeal or just going for it with big racing symphonies at their back. A few moments feel like a spear to the chest, making them memorable, as in murder. I love the guitars on that track. It's an invigorating feeling to the bone. And also Faster has a super hooky chorus that felt like the band were holding a glue gun to my eardrum. But outside of a few other memorable rides, I just go in and out. And I think a lot of that boils down to personal preference for me just not being super keen on this brand of rock. A lot of the songs just sound very similar. So the longer we go, the more bogged down I feel in monotony. The Unforgiving goes down in the C tier. I don't at all hate it. They just didn't give me a ton to latch onto outside of giving me, I guess, a few major keys to the kingdom. And finally, Truth to Power by Moonwalker as requested by the patron Mark. 
Meet Moonwalker, a duo who seem hell-bent on mocking the silliness of oppression and extremism, making for a lavish retro-cool record with a sound reminiscent of everything from The White Stripes to David Bowie and back again. The seven-song outing Truth to Power takes a swing at hooking you on the slow burn, working in fiery riffs layered over jaunty drums and standout bass as you hear the world burning down with a smile on its face. I really do enjoy the sound overall, but what surprised me even more is just how much better the deep cuts sound even compared to the likes of the singles, like The TV Made Me Do It or Tear Down the Wall. It can get a little stagnant at times as you try to process some of the headier concepts they're poking at, but I had a blast with the likes of New Commandments and its very flamboyant persona that goes for the stars, and the closing track This Dark Town that lets its momentum shift in the final act as their guitar work hits a fever pitch. But hands down, my favorite cut was Disturbed Suburbia, a really vintage wave of garage pop that nails its social dilemmas head on. Why do we fear so much of what we don't know or understand, and why should that divide us? Overall, I enjoyed this, and I see potential for the future if they continue refining these classic sounds into something even more distinct. And for now, I'm giving a B tier to Truth to Power. This is a bittersweet moment for me as we say goodbye to the quarterly album awards, but again, it'll be back next year as a biannual thing, and thank you to everybody who has shown support to these videos by liking, sharing, commenting, and just seemingly enjoying what I've put out there. If you want to catch up on some of the past roundups, those are on screen now. My Patreon is linked in the description down below along with my socials, and I'll be back soon for more right here on ARTV.